One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Now, you're currently uh, doing speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. what, what do you speak to students about? Well, speaking engagement, it's a sort of entertainment stroke lecture, really. Officially, it has to be called a lecture, and of course it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it is also uh, an evening of, uh, of extreme stupidity. And, um, and uh, well, I also talk about the meaning of life, not the movie, but I mean, I do get pretty deep as well, of course, <laughs> in a slightly silly way. Yeah. So it's more of a stand up routine? Yes, no uh, quick fire jokes, one liners, or a high energy comedy, um, but uh, there is some extreme stupidity, yes. Y your humor is, is the absurd. Is that mm. the way you are? I mean, is that your true humor, this, this kind of absurd? I'm always. Uh, I suppose slightly off center, slightly. Um, uh, I adopt an approach which is perhaps not the expected one. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know quite why. It's just that is part of my nature, though. I suppose yes. I don't want to fit in at all. Is that the difference between British and American television? Do you think British TV gives their audiences a little bit more credit? I think it does. Um, on the whole, yes, there, there are exceptions there too. We've got some pretty dumb programs as well, um, and some pretty dumb executives. But uh, yeah, th th there is a difference there, of course, because here there is so much more commercial pressure. Uh, the uh, TV executives naturally are thinking, uh, well, they've got to earn the money, and they've, they've got to uh, persuade the uh, people that are paying them, the, uh, the people that make the dog biscuits or whatever it is, that uh, a, l a huge section of the population is going to watch their, their programs. Um, and, and that's why I, I think they tend to try to appeal to the, the lowest common denominator, or what they imagine is the lowest common denominator. Um, so that is a, is a pressure that we don't have so much in Britain, because even on the commercial channels, uh, the advertising is not linked to the, to the program at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just advertising on the channel as a whole. Do you miss the Monty Python days? That's what you're best remembered from that? Yes. Um, well, I do and I don't. I mean, they were, they were very good days, but there were, there were also problems. We were six people uh, trying to do one show, uh, six very different people. Uh, so there are inevitable problems and pressures. Uh, it's very difficult to get six people to agree on, on any one thing. Uh, uh, we did once or twice, for instance, with um, uh, Life of Brian. We were in total agreement as to what sort of shape that movie should take. And, uh, it therefore had a beginning, a middle, and an end, which is unusual for us. Uh, <laughs> the meaning of life compared to that was rather a shapeless <laughs> entity, um, and very much showed the, uh, that there were six different minds working on it, I think. Um, so there are disadvantages and there are advantages. The adva in a practical sense, um, having been uh, a member of Python, it does mean that I can get into people's offices and uh, uh, hand them scripts, and you know, I can actually see the boss. Uh, but then, of course, the boss reads the script expecting it to be Python, which it isn't. It's something I've created, and uh, there may be something in it which is Pythonic, because I was part of Python, but, but really it is something quite different. Mm -hmm. mm. When you started that, working, doing the Monty Python thing, did you ever imagine that it would become as big as it has become and such a cult favorite? Well, I think when, we've, when we started in the early days with the BBC, Prior to, prior to Python, we'd, we'd all been really just writers. We'd been writing for other comedians. Uh, and partly out of frustration, uh, I mean, we, we would go along to script meetings and uh, material would be read out and, and the, the actors would, would read it and, and laugh a lot and then say, we can't possibly do that. It's, it's too stupid or, or it's too rude or whatever. It would be bad for their image is really what they were saying. Well, we didn't give a damn about our images, uh, but we did like the material. Uh, and. Uh, Really, the, the only criteria, as far as we were concerned, about in, including some material in a, in a script was whether the rest of the group liked it. If they did, then by definition, it was funny if they had laughed, and we didn't care whether everyone else found it funny or not. Uh, fortunately, uh, a, you know, an audience did find it funny, and then the audience gradually seemed to spread out and get wider and wider. But it was uh, remarkable to us that uh, 
uh, in that we didn't ever think uh, it, it could be screened on, on television in the States because we were aware of, uh, of censorship by sponsorship um, and didn't know in those days about, uh, about the public broadcasting service. And, uh, uh, so it was kind of nice when that came along and, and they picked the show up and have been screening it on and off around the country ever since, really. And now in TV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, mm. did you expect the American audiences to, to appreciate the humor in, in the series and in the films? Well, we hoped so, didn't they? Didn't know what the, the reaction would be. Uh, but I think there is less difference than, uh, than most people would anticipate between the two countries in terms of sense of humor. Or rather, perhaps, there are people everywhere that appreciate uh, that kind of humor, which you perhaps could describe as anarchic or surreal or whatever. Um, there are people in all sorts of countries that, that, that seem to, to appreciate that, yeah. I mean, our, our first base, I suppose, of, uh, of support came from the college age group, largely, and it spread out from there. Now, I was surprised to find out that you are a doctor. Mm. What made you get into comedy? Well, it was a gradual process. I always wanted to, to be in, in comedy, really. I think at the age of uh, about eight or nine, I was a very avid listener to a radio show called The Goon Show with Peter Sellers, Spike Milligan, Harry Seacombe. Uh, that was an anarchic radio show, if you like. It, it shared with Python later the distinction of being detested by the BBC. Um, and uh, so, uh, yes, I wanted to be a goon, really, at that age, but there was no way of becoming one. I mean, how do you do it? Uh, there was no school for goonery or anything. Uh, and so I followed in my brother's footsteps. Uh, he was uh, decided that he decided at a very early age to, to, to become a surgeon. And so I followed in his wake, really, which was relatively easy to do. All the, all the, relative, you know, all the, all the related books were lying around the house, so it wasn't so difficult. Um, but um, it was quite significant. At the age of about 14, I saw uh, an excerpt from a stage review uh, by a, a group called the Cambridge Footlights, which was a review society at Cambridge University. And in the cast of that review was uh, a gentleman called Jonathan Miller. And I looked at this and thought, that's very funny. Uh, that's the university I'll go to to read medicine, you see. So <laughs> subconsciously, uh, I was heading in that direction then. And once at Cambridge uh, to take to read medicine, I, I met John Cleese while trying to join the Footlights Club. That formed a writing partnership then, which has sort of persisted on and off ever since. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, once having started on uh, the, the uh, medicine at uh, university and then later at, uh, at medical school, it, it seemed rather silly not to not to complete the, the studies. Um, there was no compelling need to, to rush out and uh, chance my arm earning a living by comedy uh, when I could when I had a student grant uh, and uh, the parents were willing at least to fork out a little cash and also though I did um, supplement my income by writing and by performing cabaret night uh, nightclubs and so on uh, and uh, towards the end of my days at uh, at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, I was uh, writing for television and uh, also appearing in a, in a review in the West End at the same time. Busy days. What would you be like now if you stayed in medicine and didn't pursue comedy? I have no idea, really. It's uh, very difficult to say. I uh, had no fixed aim as far as medicine was concerned. I, I variously thought perhaps uh, maybe skin diseases or anesthesiology or something. Uh, but um, Would you be my, frustrated? I, I did begin to worry in the, the more and more I, I experienced uh, medicine, the practical side of medicine, um, I began to realize that uh, my life would be pretty mapped out. If I had decided to go on in medicine, it suddenly occurred to me, I would know exactly what I would be doing in five years' time, what I ought to be doing in 10 years' time, 15 years' time, and so on, till the end. And uh, that just looked too predictable to me, too planned out. On balance, I thought the chances are I only had one life, so I would take the chancy option, uh, the risky one, and, uh, and uh, do something with no security in it at all, much to my parents' alarm. But uh, I'm glad that I have so far. Uh, did your parents live to see you become a star? 
Well, one of them is still surviving, yes. Um, uh, in fact, my father only died uh, three years ago. Um, if, if a star is what I am, then, then yes, I, mean, I think they were reasonably happy in the end that I, I'm, I'm doing what I am doing. Uh, but uh, I think my mother found it rather hard to, to take at the beginning when, uh, while at uh, medical school, I had the chance to go on a tour with a review to New Zealand and, um, that, uh, and then later on Broadway. And uh, that meant taking at least six months off medicine at that point, which was obviously, uh, in the parental mind, a bit of a flippant thing to do. Uh, I had decided, in my inner self anyway, that's what I wanted to do, but I pretended I was in a dilemma. Um, but fortunately, uh, uh, the, uh, I was also secretary of the students' union at the medical school at the time, and therefore got to have tea with the Queen Mother one afternoon when she was opening a new biochemistry block. And so I uh, mentioned this uh, to her. I said that I had this opportunity to go to New Zealand. And she said, oh, you must go. It's a beautiful place. So I immediately rang up my mother and said, the Queen Mother said, I must go. <laughs> and uh, well, no problem after that. She was perfectly happy. <laughs> what, what did your parents think of the Python movies? Uh, my father liked them a lot. Uh, I think my mother liked the bits with me in them, but uh, not much <laughs> else. <laughs> You say you don't think you're a star. I mean, your your name is recognizable, your face is recognizable, you've done some successful mm. work. You don't consider yourself a star? Well, I suppose I don't really relate to the sort of scenes that I that I see on, um, for instance, this this week at the, the you know, all the all the the awards, the awards uh, ceremonies and that sort of thing. I don't see myself as that that glitzy or, or, or that or, you know of that kind of nature or stature, really. I'm just, uh, yeah, I think everyone's got feet of clay, really, haven't they? So I'm just displaying my feet, that's all. Are you happy with things, with what you're doing? Yes, very. Mm. Mm. Are you happier now than during the Python days? Yes, I am, but don't tell the others. Uh, yes. <laughs> when when uh, you got out of Python, mm. did you say, gee, what am I going to do now? I mean, did, was there that element of, of uncertainty there? Yes, but I, I found that I, I quite like that. It's stimulating, really. It, it, it pushes you to do things that you otherwise wouldn't. Um, there was a sort of security with, with the Python group, which was kind of nice in one way, but also uh, it, it could have been stifling. Uh, fortunately, it was uh, the nature of the group was so changeable and mercurial that uh, it wasn't too stifling. Uh, but I think we've, uh, we have always split up to do other things anyway. I mean, even in the, the days of the television series, I was working on other things at the same time. And certainly in between movies, we've, we've all of us gone off and done different, quite different things. Mm -hmm. mm. What goes through your mind when you look at that book? Well, that's, um, what goes through my mind really is that I began writing that at the age of 37. And at that point, I really, I mean, it's an odd time to begin to write an autobiography, perhaps, but I really, at that stage, thought I wouldn't be around for very much longer. I was drinking very, very, very heavily, complete alcoholic, in fact, uh, and um, thought perhaps I had another three, four, five years, maybe, and that was it. Uh, although that, remarkably, that didn't really worry me at the time, either. I didn't see myself quitting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but fortunately, um, because of a moment at the uh, very beginning of the filming of the uh, life of the, the Holy Grail, sorry, the Holy Grail, we were out on the Scottish mountainside at seven o'clock in the morning, and I uh, had no alcohol with me. I hadn't come prepared, uh, and um, so I began to have DTs. Uh, it was rather cold and wet, which didn't help, um, uh, and uh, I was feeling particularly miserable. I had the first scene to do as King Arthur, and the scene was in fact where King Arthur goes over the bridge of death, over the gorge of eternal peril. So there was a kind of message in that, I thought at the time, uh, maybe I ought to stop this. Um, and uh, also at that stage I had uh, thoughts of another couple of, uh, of movies ahead of me, one of them being the next, next Python movie, Life of Brian, and uh, thought, well, you know, perhaps I ought to clean the act up. and. Uh, for a start, uh, it would make acting rather easier. Uh, turning up on time, remembering lines and so on would be, well, it uh, subsequently turned out to be a lot easier than it was at that stage. Um, so 
as soon as we'd finished that, that uh, movie, and more or less, I, I gave up at that point. But the only difficult thing really, honestly, was, was making that decision never to drink again. Uh, the rest was just merely you know, a bit of physical unpleasantness for three or four days, and uh, then things just got better and better. Did you work drunk prior to that, pretty much? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Very rarely sober, yeah. yeah. Are you funnier sober? I think so, yes. I mean, I, I look at some of the uh, old, old tapes now and, and uh, get rather embarrassed knowing the state that I was in. I mean, it perhaps doesn't show all that much to uh, the general public, but uh, I know how I was at that time and uh, how much better I could have been without it and how much more relaxed I would have been without it. Yeah. The title's called A Liar's Autobiography. Mm. Are there a few lies in there? Yes, there are enough to sort of comply with the title and, uh, uh, and to get me out of a lot of uh, libel problems. Mm. <laughs> Let uh. me ask you one last question. You're going to speak to students at Vanderbilt University tonight. What's the yeah. first thing you're going to say to them? I'm going to ask them for 30 seconds of abuse. Uh, and then hopefully they will throw things at me and, and shout and boo a lot. And uh, that will make me feel um, a little more relaxed, I hope, after I've dodged everything. Mm. <laughs> OK. Have you ever gone to a university and just stiffed? I mean, these people just were not on the same wavelength uh, that you were. Not quite stiffed, although uh, I wouldn't say uh, Marquette was, was a great howling success. I think there were a few, few people in the audience there who didn't quite know what was going on. But no, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a good evening, nevertheless. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good.